Uh, let me start with um, introducing myself. Um, I work at Sawyer Effect. Uh, I'm a principal engineer there. And at the beginning uh, of uh, 2015, last year, we were invited by J. Crew to take a look at what they were doing uh, with their uh, continuous delivery efforts and a uh, DevOps team that they wanted to create. Um, so the first thing we did, we wanted to take a look at what they had. And they wanted to improve the current yes. process. The current the process, process they had, they had to, to, deploy to deploy to production, production. Uh, it, will take it will take four or five, four or five hours. hours. And it had to, do, to, to be done overnight. And that's, uh, I think that the team they had was paying a, 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 a high price of, uh, of doing that. Uh, I saw the team arriving the next day either a little bit upset because they, they needed more sleep or they, they won't uh, come back. And then we didn't know uh, what's in the production deployment. We didn't know if there was a configuration file missing. And that was not ideal uh, for many reasons. Uh, it was like having a Rube Goldberg, Goldberg machine. It was like having a machine, a machine that, that uh, if you're not familiar with the term, with the term it's a, a, a machine that you, machine that you compose of many, of many small, pieces small pieces and can, and can perform, perform a, job a job after doing a lot of things, right? Uh, my dream is to have one that prepares breakfast for me. If you have any, <laughs> any ideas, uh, you, can, uh, you can help me with that. Um, but the, the problem is that it's not a standard, and the problem is that it's sort of fragile. Um, it, it has strings, it has uh, chains, and, and at some point it will fail. And you don't know wh where it failed, you don't know what the repercussions of a failure like that are. Um, um, and it's sort and of it's having, having a Sisyphus effect. effect. If, 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 you know if you know the story of, of uh, uh, Sisyphus, uh, he was, uh, he was um, uh, 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 punished by the gods, the Greek gods. So he will have to uh, carry a stone uphill every day, right? And it will never end, because he will come back and he had to do it again. So that's how it, how it felt for us. That's how it felt to do that every deployment. And it will happen again and again. And the worst, the worst part is that you don't learn from it, because um, you have to repeat the same task. And there is no automation. There is no process. There is nothing you can get from tasks like that. So a decision was made. And I think that uh, it was a very good call to, to stop doing that and start invest, investing in, in a best way to do that, or a better way to do that. So how, do, how did they uh, come to the decision? First of all, First of all I think that, I think it, that helped it helped a little, a little that, that in the last in couple, the last couple years, of years, there have been a lot of uh, Noise, noise around, uh, around uh, what DevOps, what DevOps is. is. Uh, some uh, people, some will, people will, will, will tell you, tell you uh, that DevOps is, is not something new, that you should, shouldn't call an engineer a DevOps engineer because uh, whatever reasons they have. But the fact is that the, this movement, technique, uh, role, or however you want to call it, uh, it's helping the industry a lot, but it's also a little bit misunderstood. Um, what they wanted to do is to have a better way to deploy their code. They had to do, or they, they wanted to have a better way to automate the task at hand. And they wanted to enable the developers um, to uh, improve. I, I remember at the beginning, uh, one of the managers was calling this team the enablers. And there was this revolt because they, they, they didn't want us to, uh, um, they, they didn't like the name because it felt like we were enabling the team to do things worse, right? Like, like uh, we are enabling you to be an alcoholic, things like that. Uh, but that's, <laughs> uh, what, what happened later is that uh, we, we took a look at different technologies uh, to do this. Um, at, at that moment, um, I, I knew Chef a little bit. Uh, I used Chef in my previous company uh, extensively. And uh, I, I didn't touch, uh, based on this, but who uh, in this room is a developer? And who comes from the operations side of things? OK. So um, I, 
I, I don't know if you noticed it, but the developers were sort of like, right? A little bit shy. I'm a developer too, sorry about that. Uh, and the reason I, <laughs> I apologize is because for many years, I used to build my applications and then send the zip or the uh, package to uh, the operations team, and then I would forget about it. They had to handle the uh, login mechanisms. They had to handle the uh, documentation. They had to rediscover what I did in my code, and I didn't have anything to do with that. I had no idea of the pain I was causing. So when I, I started working with Chef, I started to realize how difficult it was to support an application. But, but even with those tools, it felt a little bit out of place. It felt that uh, uh, I didn't understand, and it was a little bit difficult, at least for me. With Ansible, it was a little bit different. I think that I was used to uh, the notion of convention over configuration, coming from the uh, Rails world. Uh, I worked with Rails a little bit, and, and it was natural to me to, to uh, start working with Ansible. It was sort of fast. And not being an operations guy, that I, 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 I was very thankful for that. Uh, but also, uh, I'm, we are very used to use uh, a queue automation team. What does this mean? Uh, it means that we automate smoke tests, we automate uh, Selenium integration tests, and having all, all pieces come together was very difficult if you didn't have a, a, an, a tool like Ansible to help you do that. And uh, I wanted to talk a little bit more about Ansible to explain why we, we, we came to that decision. First of all, uh, at, at jCrew we have I would say dozens of servers for all the testing environments. There are testing environments for many teams. There is a um, disaster recovery uh, set of servers. There is a production server, uh, well, a lot of production servers. So you have many clusters of servers that you need to, ha to handle and manage. Some of them are not uh, managed by us. Usually, when you are working with corporations like this, uh, you have these with uh, um, AT&T. You have these with uh, Verizon, right? And that's usually because uh, we, we don't rely on the cloud as much as a small company. That's, that's uh, something that is changing, but uh, historically it has been like this. Um, and for us, it was very important that we didn't have to go to every server to install a new version of the uh, tool we wanted to use, right? That, uh, that decreases the amount of time that we will have to spend on the phone working with uh, the support teams of uh, the companies that will provide servers for us and say, hey, can you install this for me, please? And then come back and say, can you install it again? And another thing is that Ansible started as an open source solution. So since the beginning, they, they had a great community a great set of examples. If you go to uh, Ansible Galaxy, you will find a lot of uh, techniques and roles there ready to use. And that for me was great to generate new ideas, uh, and it was great to get examples that I can just re reuse in my code. So after deciding uh, on the tool, we, we decided to automate all things, right? We, we were happy, uh, we, we had the tools already, we had the uh, support of uh, management, so let's do it. However, uh, we, we learned this the hard way. Um, when you have a new technique or, or, or something that new that you want to use and it's supported by the industry, you tend to go full speed ahead, right? And, and that was uh, a big lesson for us because we wanted, I think we learned that uh, the organization needed to change at, the same, uh, at a slower pace. So when we felt that, we started collecting a set of lessons that I want to show, to show you. And the first lesson was that uh, you are not a unicorn, right? What do I mean with, by this? A corporation that has been established for a long time, that has, to, uh, has some revenue, some profit, and already a uh, uh, large uh, set of infrastructure in place, um, doesn't have the same luxuries of a, a new company that it's uh, using um, Amazon Web Services and, and can just uh, deploy to the cloud and with a, a 
a small number of engineers. You have to realize uh, that for you, you need first to become a teaching organization. You have a large team. You don't have one or two developers that, that just learn Ansible that can do that, make that happen. We have uh, at least uh, a couple of dozens of, of people that need to get on board with this new technique and, and this new, uh, new way of doing things. And it goes from uh, helping the team understand what breaking the bill is, helping the team understand that you need to take uh, care of the, uh, uh, the bill and, and, and the code ownership as a whole. And we also need to, to work with project managers and our managers to understand that uh, this change might take years. Uh, and this is, this is also something that we want to uh, uh, explain because it's not uh, a silver bullet. It's going to take a little while to, to make that happen. It's going to take convincing. It's going to take uh, effort. And it's going to take a lot of work. And also, we need to change our uh, hiring and review process. If you see the stats uh, um, uh, of some companies, I remember that at some point uh, they, they took the entire team to uh, one of the big startups in New York. Um, and uh, they came back the next day talking about how, how great it was that uh, this startup had um, IEL coaches, that they had uh, uh, a lot of uh, tools that uh, will tell them uh, immediately if the, the build would work or not in production. They had um, at least three different QA teams that can help them uh, find a bug. And all this was great, but I think that the notion of replicating models that don't work for you, it's something very painful, and, and, and we wanted to avoid that. If you see the stats of some of these companies, they, they follow a different um, revenue model. And that's important because uh, J. Crew has a different set of circumstances that we need to align with the effort that we wanted to, to do. Um, so we started uh, looking at the long-term solutions. Uh, we started investing uh, in daily uh, training sessions. We started helping people transition from maybe not even using uh, a Mac or not even using Linux to, uh, to uh, get proficient with the new tools that we were creating. We had to understand our infrastructure. If, if, you, uh, um, if you work with Red Hat, you know that um, one of the strengths of the operating system is the long-term support that we get, and that we know that it's stable no matter what. Right? However, um, um, we, we also had to uh, work with new ways to innovate. Uh, Usually, when, when we start working with uh, a, new, um, a new practice, a new, a new way of doing things, uh, in this case, uh, we want to rely on the new tools. You just by, uh, uh, by having Ansible, uh, which is a great tool, you're not going to transform your entire organization. You need to start innovating by collecting information, training sessions, and making the team work a, as a whole. On that note, um, I'm, I'm a big fan of something um, uh, defined as the Nash equilibrium. Uh, uh, Dr. Nash was a mathematician that um, uh,
and goals uh, per, per year. And we had to work together to create a team that can, can uh, work with every department and make things happen. Now, we also have, a, a, have people that it's able to remove blockers um, for everyone involved. Um, and this is important. When, when the build is broken, or when we cannot deploy, everyone stops and starts working on it. Um, this is, this is uh, vital for what we are doing. And the deep is, uh, it comes um, from a book from uh, Seth Godin. Uh, and the, the reason I wanted to mention it is because at the beginning it was not that easy for us. We, we wanted to, uh, to go very fast and then we found some trouble and we need to readapt. So uh, the first lesson is, is to stay calm, but also uh, the team started to uh, challenge the new ideas because um, people is a little bit reluctant to change. But at the same time, um, you blame the new uh, things, and, and especially if you are challenging the status quo, you, you want to, to uh, get back to something more comfortable. Uh, that uh, creates an environment that you need to manage. If people it's complaining about the new, um, the new tools, the new processes, it doesn't necessarily mean that you, you are not making progress. It means that you need to listen and, and you need to find a way to channelize that energy. Uh, so the way we channelize that energy is by uh, listening to every developer or every people working in our projects and understand the uh, underlying reasons behind it. For example, uh, at the beginning we were creating uh, a bigger and virtual machine for everyone. And um, we created it in isolation. Uh, we created a, a way to, uh, that it worked for the operations team. But when we saw the developers working on that, it was not necessarily a, a great tool until they explained to us why it was not working with, for them. And it was as simple as realizing that they needed to copy files every now and then to uh, uh, a testing environment, and they were doing it manually, and, and that was creating most of the pain. So understanding that, that unblocking and helping them was the, uh, one of our most important goals, um, then we went back and modified the scripts to make that happen. And that also comes with a little bit of trust. Um, we need to trust uh, the developers we have. We need to be able to tell them to uh, explain the reason is why something might not be working. Uh, if our team is too f fearful to challenge what we are creating, uh, we are not going to make a lot of progress. Uh, the, one of the reasons why the uh, Agile methodology is so challenging, wh why uh, um, movements like these are, are usually blamed for not changing uh, the environment they are supposed to, is because we, we want to adapt a new technique without enabling people to make the change. And it's important for us that we allow them to make mistakes. It's important for us that we create this trust between departments. If we need uh, a new server, and we need to explain to uh, InfoSec or to uh, uh, the other department that why and, and, and be specific about every single file that we're going to touch. We're going to spend more time trying to do an inventory of what I do than um, working on, on what I have to do. So you need to build that trust, and, and, and also you need to understand that mistakes will be made. Uh, it is very important to, to, to create an environment that fosters and enables this trust. Uh, we, we did mistakes. We, uh, we had to re, uh, re, uh, reformat a, a couple of servers at the beginning. We had to uh, uh, give more training to people that uh, we thought uh, was ready. And all this comes from creating an environment that allows people to try new things and to speak when things happen. If uh, our team is too fearful to say this is not working, you are going to find out uh, too late in, in, in the game, and that's going to be very, very expensive. I think that one of the most challenging things we have found is how, to, how can we trust our team? And trust goes in, in every direction, right? Um, you, you also have to, uh, to trust your team member when uh, she is giving you feedback. 
you also have to trust your manager when uh, she's telling you that we need to find a way to make uh, things work. And, and this goes uh, to all the team. Uh, we also leveraged some of the tools that were available to us. Um, Ansible as a tool, it's an open source solution, but also there is a product that was great for us. Um, and, uh, and one of the reasons is because by creating these tools and these um, playbooks, what we were doing was um, enabling other teams to, uh, to do their work. So we created um, reports for, for our managers. We created reports for our QA team. So they don't have to tell us every single time, hey, this is not working. This is, uh, can you please uh, change these uh, feature toggles to, uh, so we enable this, this particular feature in production. We didn't want to do that. Um, <clears throat> we wanted to delegate some of the meaningless work. And I, and, and I, uh, I don't want to, to sound very pejorative in this, in this area, but I call meaningless work something like copying files from one place to the other. I think that if we are engineers, if you hire smart people, you want them to create and solve new problems. You don't want them to spend the majority of their day copying files from one place to, to the other because you can automate that. Um, and also it comes with certain security. Uh, we, in our uh, stack, we started adding a, a Node.js application. Node.js um, uses a package manager that's called NPM. And NPM usually goes to the web uh, to bring new files. We had to build uh, a communication channel with our InfoSec department to be able to bring those files. And that comes with uh, understanding security and make sure that, that we can work together to, to make that happen. If InfoSec will tell us, no, you cannot download this file every time, then it will bring a, a new set of problems to, to our uh, deployment mechanism. And also, uh, it comes with uh, Tower CLI. Uh, it, Tower CLI, it's a bridge that allows us to continue using our Jenkins um, servers. And, and we, we delegate um, the majority of our work with Ansible Tower, but there are tools that we already had built in Jenkins, so we didn't, we didn't have to, to ditch everything and start from scratch. Uh, it allows us to, to improve, but also keep what we had in already. Um, and there is also uh, another lesson that I call the single queue. Um, at the beginning, we, we, you have different priorities. If you want to start doing this, you'll find that um, the content department needs to update your uh, website every day. They, they, they need have new prices, they have new images, they have new, a new homepage every, every week or every other day. Uh, the development team needs um, you to make the build faster or understand why the brick is, is building uh, constantly. The QA team wants uh, uh, better Cucumber reports. So how do you manage all these, these priorities? At the beginning, we were trying to, uh, uh, to interact with all of them, and, and we, we found that we were falling behind in different priorities, and that was not working for us. So, uh, we budget for unplanned work. Every day, we started measuring how much time are we spending uh, with a critical uh, problem that arises for the day. And we created an average. So we will book that time uh, for a week so no one can, can touch it. And that allows us to have some um, room to maneuver. But also, we started gathering utilization metrics. How much time are we, are we spending building new uh, tools? How much time are we spending solving uh, or uh, um, trying to anticipate fires? And how much time are we spending solving problems that arise every day? This is helpful for us because we need to understand where are we spending our time. If we don't know, if we are just reacting to everyone arriving and telling us, hey, uh, production is not giving me the loss. Can you take a look? Uh, and then you have lunch, and then there is a new uh, meeting to understand what happened uh, with the, the product information that was not in the right place. If you have all this uh, and put it together, you are not, never going to uh, find out where your time went, and you're not going to have the same result. Um, 
And also another thing that we did, it's, uh, we started using what we have at hand. Um, we, we use Red Hat and we have always used Red Hat and we already had a mechanism to build RPMs. So when we were creating our application, the new application is a Node.js application with uh, a backend built in with Clojure. And we could have um, deployed the uh, application with Node. We could have um, uh, packaged uh, the Clojure application with a jar file, right? But we already had a mechanism in place to deploy uh, uh, new packages, and we had the repositories already there. So we decided to use um, RPMs, and it's working great. You don't need necessarily need to bring all the new tools at once. You can just bring what you need and then uh, continue from there. Things working. Sorry. Right. So <clears throat> we also took a look at what uh, Ansible was providing for us. Ansible uh, has a very good um, set of uh, practices online. So we, we decided to follow them for our first project. Um, we didn't have the experience to, to, to build all the new tools, so we wanted to make sure, sure that, that we didn't re reinvent the wheel. And we used Vagrant. We already had Vagrant to deploy to our, uh, our machines. So uh, that was be very beneficial for us. Um, the bus factor. Um, at some point, we had one person that was in charge of the deployments. That was the, in the past, right? We have one person that will do the deployments at night. I don't even know what happened if that, that person was sick or, or, or I don't know, on vacation. So um, what we did was to st we started training a team. Uh, and every time we send a request, we send that to a team. Um, and, and that became uh, a, a way to do things. But also, we invested heavily in a knowledge base. Everything that, that we have is in a wiki. Everything that we have, it's, uh, it's, we make sure that it's documented. And it's a little bit tricky at the beginning because people are reluctant to do that. And we want to keep that in an, in an email. But we make sure that um, that was the case. And also, we encourage people to take vacation. If you are constantly telling people, no, you cannot take a vacation because we have a, a deployment, then we are failing as a team. Because things will happen, people, people leave, People uh, need uh, time off, and, and, and this should not stop us. The, the main goal we have is that no matter who is in the building, we have the ability to deploy, and, and that we have the ability to correct some of the features that we have in place. And um, I think the lesson nine is one of the biggest lessons of all. Um, I, I keep telling our, our team that we need to understand that you are now a tech company. If you if you think of uh, um, J. Crew, you know that they have great uh, designers. You know that uh, they are in the fashion world. But it's easy to forget that for e every corporation like this, the majority of your revenue, or a lot of your revenue, is coming from your website. Supporting websites like these are, it's very complex, it's tricky, it takes a, a a lot of uh, investment, and also in this market, when you're fighting uh, with all the different companies for the same talent, you need to realize that you need to become a tech company. You need to adapt your uh, um, training mechanism, you need to adapt your hiring, you need to, to uh, create an environment that fosters this, this uh, talent, and they want, uh, and engineers that want to work f for you. Um, So things that contribute to this is like in the last three, four years, there was a switch. Uh, I remember that in 2012, I was working in one of the first responsive and adaptive websites for a, a, an e-commerce uh, uh, solution. But now, now it's not new. Now you, you have to do it for every um, device, right? You have to be in every device. And also the, 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 cha the changes in the market, that's so critical that you don't know how can you attract talent until you try many things. So you need to, to go and try uh, to the people that, that lives in the city, they, do they care about hackathons? Do they care about uh, 
a, a better compensation package? Do they care about uh, having uh, open source solutions out there? And also, uh, I think that the, one of the uh, ideas was to have fun, was to, uh, we created um, a bot that had, um, that will create virtual environments for our developers. So instead of telling uh, one of the infrastructure engineers, hey, can you make sure that uh, my environment is ready on Monday when a new person arrives? We have uh, in HipChat a bot that when you uh, type, uh, give me a new server, it will create it for you and it will give you the IP, right? We don't have to interact with anyone. It's self-service. And, and we started gathering statistics on, on that. I'll, I'll show you in, in the results section. We started promoting new projects. Every month, there is some time aside where we can uh, get together and just build something, build a new idea. And this is not easy because you need to justify what's the benefit of doing this. But again, it goes back to understanding that we need to do this to create better ways of working and also to keep the people that, that we have in place happy. And then we started influencing other teams. The, uh, the bot to create, uh, to create virtual machines came from another team that is not uh, a deployment, uh, is not part of the deployment team. They, it was just a couple of guys that uh, became interested in the, uh, in the project. They, they, they asked us a couple of questions and they came out with this solution on their free time and, and during the hackathon and it was, uh, it was great for the company. So uh, I wanted to show up some results um, of what we have been doing just uh, to put it in perspective. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we, we finished uh, Krubot, which is self-service. You can come and, and create a, a virtual environment for you. The deployment that we have used to take hours at night, but it takes five minutes now. So from four hours to uh, at night, um, with the uh, uh, hours that we will spend doing the QA in the morning, we went to five minutes. There has been a couple of times where I'm about to uh, go to lunch, and they ask me to, uh, to uh, do a deployment. Uh, I think that the first time I stayed just to make sure that everything worked. But the last couple of times, uh, even to me, it was surprising that I could just click the button and then go to lunch. And they, I'll come back, and, and I don't have to worry about uh, the deployment not working. I don't have to worry about the deployment uh, and bringing down the house uh, as, as we did before. Uh, there was this time where um, we were increasing the load that we will send to the new application over time. And in order to do that, we needed to include seven new machines into our uh, production uh, inventory. And inventory is, is the set of uh, servers that we have in, in, in Ansible for the production uh, environment. And I remember that I was talking with the people at the, um, at the, in the operations department, and they asked me, how, how long will it take for us to add these new servers? And I was um, a little bit too quick when I answered this, and I said, five minutes, right? <laughs> and and, and the, the immediate response was, Nothing takes five minutes. And, and, I, and I, I kept that in the back of my mind, but when I went and added the new IPs, it, it literally took five minutes. And, and, and that was a uh, very surprising thing for me. Um, I, we were calculating costs in the, our operations department. I think they went down um, by 20% uh, in the first year. I think that this year uh, we, we will do the exercise again and we should go a little bit below that. Um, and our, the, the changes and, and the amount of time it took for us to, uh, to start seeing improvements, it was about two months. At the beginning, it was um, um, mostly configuration and learning how to, how to do things, but it took about two months for us to see the results. Uh, the, there has been an increase in productivity. I, I don't like to, to measure productivity in terms of... Uh, like in subjective terms, but I think that we produce more and, 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 and people is happier. Um, we started doing more uh, support and, and our training mindset changed. So now uh, instead of relying on people, we, we, we rely on, on recipes that we can share across the uh, company. 
And this is what I wanted to show. Uh, we have uh, an, every time you build a new virtual machine, we have an automated response. Um, so when you show the, um, the build, you, you also say this uh, script has saved this amount of minutes, this amount of many hours, and in, as a result, it has saved the company this amount of money. And I think that it's reinforcing the message of what we did. It's, it's making sure that the perception uh, changes over time and, and we focus more on automation. And this is only one script that came from a side, from a side a team uh, out of the hackathon. It, it doesn't have anything to do with the work that we are doing. I just wanted to exemplify it because the, uh, the team did a great job here. Now, um, I wanted to talk more about the future. You know that um, now we, we are a, bit, a little bit worried about politics and all that, but uh, I, I think that we anticipate the future to be great for every one of us. <laughs> um, so the future for, for us is that we are adding two more brands. Um, uh, J.Crew manages two more brands. One is uh, Maywell and, and one is J.Crew Factory. And, and for us, it has been as easy as adding two more uh, configuration files. And, and this is a, a big win for us because we didn't have to redo the deployment mechanism that we put in place. Before, we will have three different ways of deploying, almost similar, but with little changes. Uh, and now we, we only have one recipe to, to, uh, to handle them all. We need to upgrade to uh, a new, newer version of Ansible. We haven't done that yet. And we also need to redistribute these uh, roles across the company um, because um, we want to, people to reuse them more. So in summary, uh, we want to uh, invite everyone to uh, use Ansible, adapt as you go, and have, uh, have fun. Um, but also, I wanted to dedicate a, a little bit of time to any questions you may have because I know that every Every organization is different, so if you have any question, just uh, let me know and we'll try to uh, solve it. Who, who is going to, I, I know that everyone has questions, so don't worry. Yep. So I'll, I'll try to speak a, a little bit more about uh, how how the pipeline is it's built. Um, so we, we modify all the scripts in, uh, in a plain editor. I use Atom myself, right? We test every script change with a, a set of background instances in my local uh, machine. So the Mac can run six different machines. Uh, when I make sure that it's working on a develop branch, uh, I commit that. And that will trigger a Jenkins build for uh, the deployment mechanism. Um, if that's working, then at some point every, uh, every other day we merge to master, and that becomes part of the uh, deployment pipeline. Um, we deploy the uh, application from Jenkins. After every commit we build, uh, we deploy it with, uh, with Ansible to uh, a CI server, and, and we, we run some smoke tests that we build with Selenium, Cucumber and Phantom JS. If we see that the application is healthy, there is a trigger that the QA team can uh, activate to go to QA. That's again using Ansible and our deployment, and where we are gonna uh, run a set of regression tests uh, that are automated. Uh, the automation was made um, with uh, again with Cucumber, Phantom JS, and uh, and it will assess the uh, the majority of the features, if they are uh, green or red. Um, if we determine that it's healthy, then it's, it's the same playbook we, that we use for every deployment. Uh, if we determine that it's healthy, uh, we will move it to, uh, to the two more gates. So uh, when we determine that one of the gates is uh, it's working, um, we, we have a, a, a button that someone needs to, to push to, uh, to uh, make it uh, arrive to production. And there is no reason why we, we will wait. It's just that we are waiting to, uh, to have a, a, the majority of our automation tests uh, 
there we want to trust them enough so, so we can go to production automatically. Um, but that's, that's um, I think that's how it's, uh, it's set up. The, uh, we have a series of inventories. I would say that we have six in inventories with different uh, group bars. And all that, it's, uh, it's, it shares the same playbook. We only have one playbook to handle everything. And I would say that we have around 20 different roles uh, that we will be answer. Uh, the the gates are um, nothing more than someone needed to, needed to activate the tower deployment, um, and, and that's where we migrate one of the RPMs from the QA repository to the uh, um, UAT repository. Um, but all the deployments, all the uh, everything that has to do with copying files and 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 restarting servers, uh, it's, it's done with Ansible. Uh, they are static. I think that in in a lot of these corporations, um, it's going to be very difficult that you do it uh, with uh, with servers that you can uh, create or, or dispose. And I think it has to do with the historically uh, Rackspace or, or Amazon. They are a little bit reluctant to sign SLAs uh, that big. And I think that's the reason. I never seen one of these big companies that you work with uh, being that willing to to move to. Uh, Rackspace, for example, or, or Amazon, or but uh, it's getting there. Yes. So internally, all all the bots that we have uh, are are, are uh, vagrant uh, machines that we create. Yeah. So uh, we have. I think that we serve our uh, developer needs that way. Um, and um, and if we if we can go to a more hybrid uh, cloud versus uh, uh, bare metal uh, solution. Uh, I think that it, it depends on the contract, but there is no, nothing that it's prevented us to do that technically. Yep. Uh, they were using Maven and Ant, but uh, nothing for uh, managing the configuration. And even ourselves, we, we are still trying to, uh, uh, I think that the, the way we manage the configuration can be improved a little. The way we handle it right now, it's um, we have a, a set of configuration files that we create on the fly. That means that um, all the uh, variables are already in, in Ansible. And when, um, when the build is ready and we deploy, we inject the configuration files. Um, we want to improve that because when there is one configuration change, uh, we, we have this debate be between, should we just copy that file and restart, or should we just repackage everything and, and, and ship everything so we have a, a golden bean plus the configuration? That's what something that we still need to solve. But I, I think that Ansible was, was, uh, um, was the first. No? Any other questions? Sorry? Correct. Crubot uh, doesn't integrate with um, Ansible Tower, although we, we could do that. Crubot um, integrates with uh, HipChat. Um, so, because it's, a, it's, it's more natural for, uh, for our team to be in, in the team chat, and then if, if you need anything, you just, you just uh, type something there. Um, but there's, uh, the QA team, for example, can go to Ansible Tower. They have their own user with the, the particular uh, permissions, and then can deploy to the QA environments uh, at will. So there is no interaction between any of the teams to deploy uh, to, to deploy to the testing environments with us. Where? Uh, we have a, a, a big uh, uh, VM lab that you can partition in with Vagrant internally. So what happens is that when you say, uh, give me a new, uh, a new VM, it checks if that particular user already has one, uh, a Vagrant machine running. 
uh, associated with your uh, Active Directory ID. If it's not uh, there, then what you do is uh, you create a new a bigger machine with that ID, with the user ID, and return the IP to them. And that machine will be running internally one of the uh, uh, servers that we have in New York. Yeah, I think that, uh, yeah, this, this is a very, uh, very good question. Um, I think it was a new team, and it has to be a new team, uh, at least partially. And the reason is, it's a very different mindset. Traditionally, when you have a, an application that has been running for some time, you enter support mode. The original uh, team that created the uh, deployment mechanism is not, it's not there anymore. In the case of uh, the crew, they use uh, an old e-commerce platform called uh, Blue Martini. Uh, there is almost no support for Blue Martini anymore, so there is no not a lot of help. Uh, we created a new team with the uh, we train people, and we also I, I'm a, I'm not a jQuery employee, so I'm I'm helping them, and we uh, focus on two things: one, uh, sharing the the new habits with with the team, making sure that we understand why we are doing things but also training the, uh, the engineers that you have. Um, but it, it is a different culture, and I would say that it needs to be a different team that either adapts to the new way of doing things or that, um, that has different, uh, a different set of skill set. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, um, Again, uh, traditionally, uh, what many companies will do is they will divide their uh, operation or support teams in two, right? The people that created the original scripts, they, they are developers or, or, or they are part of the consultant company that came in, and then they, they have people and, and team members that are able to operate the, uh, and restart the scripts, log in and, and, and take a look at the logs, but that's about it. What this is going to create for you is that you are going to have, um, you needing your team more skillful engineers. Um, that, that will rep be represented in, in people with more years of experience or more experience doing uh, uh, development. That will be represented in probably higher salaries. That it's important to, to understand that you cannot, I mean, if an engineer understands the market, they know how, how uh, the skills are valued. It's very difficult to, to uh, hire someone with the skills needed and, and try to pay um, what you were paying before if you, you don't have the skills. Um, so that's also something that we, we as, as the management team need to uh, understand, uh, the right value of, of these skills in the market. And also, it's a, it's a different culture. Um, I think that I, I found that people that, that thrives in, in learning and in, in confidence in, in trust uh, it's you need to let them be and 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 you can express the goals but they they are more self-sufficient so uh, that means that you as a, as a team tech lead or as a manager need to take a step back and learn to define objectives but learn to trust the team as well uh, and that's uh, one of the biggest changes uh, one of the biggest changes is when um, you have a team that is used to getting directions, but it needs to be transformed into a team that, that needs to create uh, solutions based on a, a given problem. So I think when, when I was talking uh, about one team, I was talking about the main goal of, of the department. So you can have groups between that team as long as you share the goals with them. And, and this is important because you don't want, um, what, you have in, what you had in the past, you know, in, in, traditionally, is the operations team, it's happy as long as there is no uh, fire, fire to, to uh, to put off, right? They, they are happy because nothing is burning. 
while the development team wants to go faster. Even if you go to a meetup, you'll find that the developers in the meetup are usually happy trying to, what, what can we do to create more? And when you go to an operations uh, and talk with an operations team, they are usually thinking, what can we do to be more secure? Those uh, used to be exclusive. By creating one team, we, we share the goals. The development team needs to understand that, yes, uh, Node.js came out with a new version yesterday. That doesn't necessarily mean that I will put it in production today. And uh, that, that's, that takes uh, understanding of the implications of you bringing a new Node version that is not tested into a production environment. And also, the operations team uh, needs to understand that you you don't necessarily have to start with a no when, when they, they come and say, hey, can we do this? You, you, because in the past, you were burned so many times that you already have a no in, in your sleeve, right? Like, hey, can we? No. So you change that by, by listening a little bit more and understanding that there might be a, a benefit of uh, applying a new tool or, or, or technique. So that's what, what I was referring to. It's like sharing that common goal and, and understanding that it's the same company and, and not you are not necessarily trying to, uh, to cancel each other's efforts. I think that's it. Yep. Right. Uh, well, thank you, everyone. If you have any questions, just shoot me an email. Thanks.